you have your Bible, go ahead and open to the book of John, chapter 1. We're, we're going to get there in a little bit, but that's kind of where we're going to be settling for a while. So John, chapter 1, and just kind of hold your place there. Does anybody know what today is? What significant event begins today? Hanukkah. 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 <laughs> I don't know why, but in elementary school, back when such things were allowed, we actually had a, a uh, Jewish person come in and share with us about Hanukkah. And that's all I remember was it was Hanukkah. <laughs> um, we're going to talk a little bit about Hanukkah. Um, we're going to get a little bit of history. Actually, you're going to get kind of a lot of history squished together here. Um, 329 BC-ish. Um, Alexander the Great moves down south out of Syria and conquers Israel. And he, he conquers it in a very simple way. They surrender. Um, the high priest at the time... Uh, decided there were one of two things that they could do. They could um, fight, but he had seen the devastation that Alexander wrought at Tyre, and he knew that fighting was not an option for Israel against this army. And so when Alexander came, uh, the story goes that he was riding his horse, uh, that uh, between him and the horse, he was about 13 and a half feet tall, sitting on the top of his horse. And the high priest met him at the gates of Jerusalem, and Alexander actually got off of his horse and bowed down to him. Now, Alexander understood the idea, the concept of monotheism, which is really strange because he was Greek, and the Greek had the whole pantheon of gods, and there's a god and a goddess for everything. But he uh, was a student, a disciple of Aristotle, and Aristotle believed that there was the possibility of only one God. And so when he came to Israel, this was not a unique idea. This was not something that, that uh, he found repulsive in the way that the Persians did. And so uh, the Jews surrendered, and he, was, he gave them a lot of autonomy. Um, he went on to go further east into India and, and then die. Um, now, for those of you familiar with scripture, um, Daniel's vision of the four beasts are thought to be the, the four empires, uh, the, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Greeks, and then the Romans. Um, the upshot of it is, um, the kingdom that Alexander built was divided into four parts. And there's only two parts that we are really concerned about. Um, Seleucus <coughs> took over Syria. And Ptolemy <coughs> took over Egypt. And sandwiched right in between them was Israel. <coughs> and Israel was a source of constant fighting back and forth. It was the crossroads. It went from <laughs> Egypt up into Mesopotamia and from the, the waters of the Mediterranean out east into India, and, and so it was the crossroads where everybody went through, and so it was a very strategic location. And um, they went back and forth till about 198 BC, and Seleucid III finally defeated the Tol Ptolemaic Empire and, and took Israel for himself. And uh, he, he was very aggressive in trying to Hellenize the Jews. Now, Hellenization first, the Greeks didn't call themselves Greeks, okay? They're referred to throughout history as uh, Hellenists from Helen of Troy. So when you see Hellenists or Hellenized or Hellenization, they're talking about their, the Greek culture. And Hellenization is the Greeks had a, an incredible way of dealing with the people that they conquered. They just integrated them into their society, and the Romans took a, a big lesson from that. And the problem was... Um, in order to be Hellenized, you had to start embracing the free thinking of the Greeks. And when Seleucid III was attempting to 
changed the mind and the direction of the Jews, he ran into some, some conflict. They were, uh, no, we have a temple that is for one God, and you try to bring those other gods in here, the entire nation will rise against you. And so Seleucid III kind of took at that, and he said, oh, okay, you know what, we'll, we'll back off a little bit. So he dies, and his son, Seleucid IV, comes to power. And he pushed the Hellenization very, very hard. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, two of the groups that we see, actually three of the groups that we see at the time of Jesus, the, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and the Essenes, all come out of this Hellenization process. Okay? The Sadducees got on board with it. Okay? Um, they made peace with the, the Greek thinking. They kind of blended it in together, and, and that became, uh, at that point, was the ruling class. Um, the Pharisees, at that point, they were not the uh, Pharisees. This is pre-Pharisees. Pre They're called uh, the Hasidim, which is not to be confused with the Hasidim of today. Um, but they, they looked at what the Sadducees were doing, and they said, no, no, we're not giving up the traditions and the law to accept this stuff. And they, they came up basically out of rebellion to the compromise that the Jews were, were settling into with the Greeks. And, um, and then the Essenes also came out of this, and they said, we want nothing to do with any of you. We're going on our own because we're the only ones God loves and chose anyway, so see ya. So we, we see the birth of these things that you see throughout Jesus' ministry in the book of Acts. We see these things happening way back in, in about uh, 170 160 BC. Okay, um, Antiochus, um, early on in his ruling, faced a rebellion when he started pushing this agenda, and he put it down very harshly. And because of the rebellion, he just decided, hey, in for a dime, in for a dollar. I'm not going just a little way, I'm going the whole way. And he, about uh, 169 AD, he actually entered into the holy place and he sacrificed a pig on the altar and erected a, an idol to Zeus. Okay, You guys are going, yeah, I'm not really that into history. Stay with me, okay, because we're going to get somewhere. You know, it's like the road trip. You've got to go past all the loves, all the exons, all the pit stops to get to where you're going. So just hold on, all right? You might even pick up a fancy souvenir here. Um, so... The Jews, they're stuck now. They, their, their temple has been desecrated. It has been profaned. And, but, but Antiochus, is, Antiochus um, the fourth Epiphanes, um, he decides, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not going to stop here. I'm going to be a god. And so he declares himself Epiphanes, Theo Epiphanes, which means... Um, God raised up, and he, he builds a statue, has a statue built of himself, and it's taken from village to village in, in Israel, and all the Israelites are supposed to bow to it, showing that, oh yes, we, we accept you as a God. And we actually have coins dated back to this time with Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, the God raised up. Well, they get to um, a little village, and the statue comes in, and they say, you need to bow, okay? Um, the, the village uh, was called Moda'im, and one of the leaders in the village walked up to bow down and worship it, and a priest who happened to live in that village, um, his name was uh, Matthias, he took a spear and he killed the man that was getting ready to bow down to this idol. And then he took the spear and he killed the official that was trying to make them bow down. And this began the Maccabean Revolt. Yeah. Okay, come on, get to it. I'm getting there. Okay. Okay. Um, Matthias had five sons. Okay. Um, they were known um, as the Maccabees, which means hammer. Uh, that was specifically for one of the sons, but the whole family became known as the Maccabees. Uh, if you have a Catholic Bible, 
Uh, there's two books in the apocryphal writings, the intertestamental writings, uh, Maccabees 1 and Maccabees 2. They discuss this whole thing. Okay? Um, the Maccabees rise up in revolt, and they're joined by the pre-Pharisees, the Hasidim. Okay? And they wage this revolt. It ended up lasting almost 25 years, but, but the short part of it is, is Antiochus raises an army, he sends it after him, he's like, oh, these, these people, you know, my dad took care of them, everybody's taking care of them, they're not going to do anything, the army got wiped out. So Antiochus kind of stepped back and went, hmm, all right, maybe a little more difficult than I thought. So he raises a bigger army, and he sends that after him, and, and keeping in mind that there wasn't a standing army in Israel at this time. So it's just the dudes, you know, and they meet them in battle, and Israel defeats them a second time. And um, the upshot of it is, about 164 BC, the Jews reclaim Jerusalem and the temple. Okay, and <clears throat> they can't worship because it's been desecrated. So they need to cleanse the temple. They need to put everything the way that uh, it's supposed to be. They need to take the profane out and make it holy again. And they, they come across a, a problem because there's only one jar of oil that is suitable for lighting the menorah. And that's the, the lamp in the holy place that is to be kept lit all throughout the night. And that was one of the priest's job was to keep the menorah lit. Well, there's only one jar of oil and that's sufficient for one night, for, for one day period to keep the menorah lit. And they had to go through a process to make the oil because it had to be pure oil. And the process takes about a week. Well, what do we do? We've only got enough oil and, and we, we're dedicating the temple, but we don't have enough oil to keep the light lit. And that's a violation of what God commanded regarding his temple. And, and so they put the oil in and miraculously, it stayed lit for eight days. Okay? And the Jews declare a festival, it's called the Feast of Dedication, Hanukkah, which means dedication. It's also known as the Festival of Lights. Okay? Now this is not one of the high days, but even, um, I mean, anybody here not heard of Hanukkah? Okay, see? Uh, how many of you have heard of Purim? Or Shavuot? Or some of these other days that, that are much higher in the Jewish scale than, than Hanukkah? But we have Hanukkah because why? It falls right around Christmas. It always fits in right around Christmas with us. So today marks the first day. It's an eight-day celebration, the Festival of Lights, the Feast of Dedication. And for those of you that have seen a menorah uh, with the nine, that's actually not a menorah. It's, it's actually a uh, Hanukkah. Okay? The menorah only has six branches. The menorah has eight with a center one that stands up a little bit higher than the other eight, okay? And the whole idea behind Hanukkah is that you take the candle in the middle, it's called the servant candle. You light it, and then you use that candle and you light the right candle first. And you keep that lit for no less than half an hour. And then you can blow it out or let it go out on its own. The second night, you take the servant candle, you light the first one, and the second one, but actually you light it in reverse order because new is always given precedence over old. So the second candle would be lit first and then the first candle. The third night you would go three, two, one, and so on. So the eighth night all of the candles are lit. And this is the, the celebrating of Hanukkah. And they, they play the, the dreidel, which by the way, Jeannie, I found out how that's played. Talk to me afterwards and I'll share with you. Um, and, they, for, and for whatever reason, I don't know why, but they always celebrate it with fried food. <laughs> I, hey, you know, that's where maybe the South got it. I don't know. Um, my first year of college, every meal I ate was fried. I didn't know you could fry every vegetable and fruit, but they did, and I ate it. Um, so, here's, here's the upshot. God was not idle during the intertestamental period. And we've talked about this in years past. God was moving on a global scale in this period. 
having Alexander come to Israel was part of God's plan. Well, well, how could it be part of God's plan for him to conquer Israel without even a fight? Because that paved the way for things to come down the road. Greek is a very efficient language. Okay? Um, it works wonders, and, and it leaves a lot of the confusion that we have with English out. Okay? So, Greek would become, and was at that time becoming, the nationwide or the international language. Okay? So, we see that God was setting into place this, this idea that his gospel could be sent out some 230 years later by allowing Hellenization to happen in Israel. And, and they had such an incredible culture that the Romans, who were the last beast, the, the iron, they actually <clears throat> embraced their culture and used the same idea to propagate throughout their kingdom. And that brought about a number of things that were put Jesus' birth in an incredibly, incredibly tactical time because the Romans built the vias, the roads. You could go from Spain all the way down to Egypt on a Roman road, okay? Um, everywhere their armies went, they built roads. Why? Because the roads expedited the movement of armies from point A to point B. And so the armies would build roads to all of these different places, which was interesting because when the gospel went out, Jesus said, you'll be my witnesses from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the uttermost parts of the world. All right? They had ways to get there now. The Pax Romana, the Peace of Rome. This was also important because not only could you get from Egypt to Hispania, to Spain, you could do so in relative safety. Okay? Um, because the Roman soldiers, you know, hanging people on crosses has an impact. Somebody does something that the state doesn't like, they put them up on a cross and you have to walk by and see it. It makes you think twice about doing that. All right? So the Pax Romana was a second outspring of this. And then the Greek language. Okay? Now you could go from Spain to said Egypt and anywhere in between and speak a language that would be understood in the, the communities. Okay? The Greek. All right? So all of this was had a point. It wasn't just by accident that it happened, okay? And into this was Christ born. Now, what I find interesting, um, if you, you have your Bibles on John 1, let's go back a couple chapters. We're actually going to hit John 10 really quick. Um, Now, I'm going to state something that I know every one of you is going to think is very obvious, but this year I kind of had it in a new light. Did you know that Jesus didn't celebrate Christmas? Did you, did you, did you understand that? Do you understand that the celebrating of Christmas didn't come until several hundred years after? And the whole purpose for the celebrating of Christmas, why the emphasis was put on Christmas was because people had gotten to the point where they were looking at Jesus as just God and not man. And so the church decided we need to emphasize his birth to show that he wasn't this because there were uh, false doctrines coming out that, oh, he was never really a man. He was just God in man form. And there were a whole bunch of bizarre things that came out of that. And so they said, no, we're going to make a celebration of his birth. Okay, but it was considered a very minor celebration because the best thing about Jesus was his death and resurrection. It's only been in recent times that Christmas has superseded Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday as being more prominent and more important in people's minds. Okay, so Jesus didn't celebrate Christmas, but he did celebrate Hanukkah. Did you know that? Look down in verse 22, okay? Verse 22, at that time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon, okay? The Feast of Dedication that they're talking about there, that's Hanukkah, 
When it says dedication in Hebrew, that would just be Hanukkah. Or Hanukkah. Okay? Come on, you guys can do it. Say it with me. <laughs> Don't spit on your neighbor. Okay. So, we see right here that Jesus was celebrating a, a Jewish holiday just like all the other Jews were. Okay? And what's interesting is Jesus is celebrating the festival of lights. And here he is in their midst of the festival of lights. And who is Jesus? What? I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. Let's flip back to John 1. We're going to read through here. Because John caught something through the revelation of God's Spirit, the Spirit leading him that I want us to pick up on. See, I have a point to all of this history. <laughs> We're going to start in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. Okay. How many of you have your houses decorated already? Come on, be honest. How many already decorated? Wow. Okay, how many are lame like me and haven't decorated your house yet? Okay. How many are decorating your house this week? Because we got a party this next weekend that we got decorated for. So, in your decorations, I'm, I'm guessing lights have something to do with the decorating. Either on the tree, around the tree, on something, there's lights. And this is kind of a carryover, a, a handing off from Hanukkah with the lights. And, and for some reason, the lights just make things better, don't they? Uh, what did God use to announce the birth of his son? A star. Well, why in the world did he use a star? He could have used a cloud. I mean, he used a cloud in the Old Testament. That's right. He used light. Okay? The light reflecting off of the sun and that star settling in place over Bethlehem so to guide the wise men which I, I earnestly believe that's the whole point of why Israel went into uh, Babylon was to share the wisdom. I believe Daniel's writings were what caused those wise men to study and look for the stars and came back to, to Bethlehem to find Jesus. Okay, So um, the light shone down. The wise men came. And where did they find him? Where did they find Jesus? In a house. Stable was some two years before. He was in a house. He, he wasn't in a stable at this point. Check your scriptures. Okay? Because we get caught up in the fanciful Hollywood eye story of the birth of Jesus. And, and how many wise men were there? I don't know. We have no clue. We know there were three gifts. But it doesn't ever say there were three wise men. And I don't know where they got the names. You know, somebody was telling a story to their kid and, and came up with three names. I don't know. Okay, But that's, that's not scripture. Okay, That's tradition, but it's not scripture. Okay, But my point is, the light had come into the world. And the world did not know it. As a matter of fact, for the first 30 years of his life... Um, 
the world didn't know it. As a matter of fact, does anybody know uh, of a prophecy predicting Jesus as being the light? Maybe out of Isaiah chapter 9? Okay, flip over to Isaiah chapter 9 to take a quick look. Okay, so we're in Isaiah chapter 9. I'm going to start in verse 1, but verse 2 is what we really want to get to. <clears throat> so Isaiah 9, 1. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. Oh, does that catch your attention at all? Galilee? The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. Now this is significant because Jesus was born in Bethlehem, stayed there for a, probably a couple years. We estimate that. How? How do we know that Jesus was there to uh, probably a couple of years? The death of the Jews. That's right. When Herod asked how long the light had been shining, they told him it was about two years. Okay? Because when he sent the order to kill the children in Bethlehem, he said, any male child, two years or under. Okay? So we're guessing he was there for probably about two years. That's a long time for a star to be shining on that one spot. Those people needed a faster camel. Okay? So then he goes to Egypt. God takes him and sends him to Egypt to fulfill yet another prophecy. And, and next week we're actually going to start looking at some of these prophecies that were fulfilled in the birth and the early part of Jesus' life that he had no control of, okay? So he goes to Egypt, and then Herod dies, and God sends him back, but they go up to Nazareth. Now, in the three and a half years of Jesus' ministry, we know that more than three of those years were spent in the region of Galilee, okay? And here we see, let's look at this again, uh, verse 2. Well, actually, I'm going to back up. Um, verse 1, I'll just start from the beginning. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former times, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter times, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. Okay? Um, now, there's a couple of different things right here that I want to point out to you. Okay? When they are looking, um, the land of Zebulun and Naphtali, that's the area right below the Sea of Galilee, okay? And when he says, Galilee of the nations, he, it's the nations were those nations that they were to kick out of Canaan, okay? They kicked out, they were supposed to destroy them, but most of them ended up moving to the east side of the Sea of Galilee, and that was called the land of the seven ites, or the, the seven nations, Okay, those seven represented all the world, anybody that was not Jewish. Okay, so when they're saying Galilee of the nations, they're referring to those nations on the east side of Galilee that were not Jewish. Okay, and then he goes down and he says, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them light has shone. So, Jesus raised in Nazareth, and then spends the bulk of his ministry, as a matter of fact, his headquarters was on the northern shore of Galilee in Capernaum. Okay? And do you remember the curse that he spoke against the three towns? That they would be destroyed and, and no one would ever live there again? It was Capernaum, Chorazin, and Bethsaida. Okay? Those were three Jewish towns that should have known that the light was there, and yet they're the ones going, isn't this the carpenter's son? Where does he get off doing this kind of stuff? I mean, he's talking, he's got big talk. Where does he talk like that? Yeah, we know he raised a dead guy. We know he healed the lame, and he, and he healed the blind, and he healed the deaf, and he cast out demons, but where does he get off thinking he's something special? 
I don't know. If somebody did that around me, I don't think my thing would be to challenge them. If they were my son, maybe. Because, <laughs> you know, his mom and his brothers came and his sisters came and tried to get him out of the mess they thought he was getting himself into. Okay? But Jesus spends the bulk of three and a half years in this area in the Sea of Galilee. Okay? The light is shining, but just like John says, they didn't recognize it. They didn't know it. Okay, so let's uh, go back to John. We're going to spend a minute here. John 1. I know I'm having you bounce around. Um, it's good for you. It's like a sword drill. <laughs> you guys ever wander, wonder or ponder how much irony Jesus saw in his life? All the things that he was fulfilling that he knew he was fulfilling and nobody got. You know, here he is, the light of the world, and he's celebrating the Festival of Lights. Here he is, the spotless lamb, and he goes up to offer sacrifice. Do you ever wonder, as, as a human, the part of Jesus that just kind of went, I do, all the time. Uh, the book of Mark, especially. I love reading the book of Mark because I can just see Jesus. Kind of like when my boys were little and we were trying to do a project. And I would say, go do this. And they would go and they'd come back and they didn't do it. And I'd be like, why didn't you do that? I did. No, you didn't. It's not done. Well, what did you mean? Well, I, I wanted you to pick this up and move it there. Oh, I moved the other thing. Okay, well, go pick that up and move it there. And depending which child of mine it was, it would either get picked up and move to the wrong spot, or something else would get picked up and move to the right spot, or he would just issue directives to the others to do whatever I told him to do. Okay. I'll let you figure out who's who. Um, <clears throat> but I love the irony that here's Jesus that is called the light of the world. Now, in verse... 10, I'm sorry, verse 9, the true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. Okay? He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. Now, last week, we talked about um, being thankful. Remember that? I looked, took you into Revelation, and we looked at what heaven is going to be like. And I, I want to challenge you to keep that picture in mind, okay? Because in this new place, we will no longer need the light of the sun or the moon. Because God, his presence there, and Jesus will be all the light that we need, okay? Now, think about that God put into the flesh of a man and coming here to earth and it begins to make sense. This is not an allegorical thing that he's talking about. He is speaking about a truth that we just don't understand because our minds don't work in the supernatural. Okay? It's not just saying he was figuratively a light. He was the light. And he came to scatter the darkness, to, to, to break it. And, but John says, what about the darkness? Hmm? They, didn't comprehend. they didn't comprehend it. We were comfortable in the dark. We were comfortable in the dark. And he came and he brought his light. Now, I, I want to caution you. Before you're too hard on the people of that time. Okay? Everybody has a story. And the people of that time were living in the midst of something great and incredible. So are we. They didn't understand it. They didn't really appreciate it. And the manner in which we look back in history and go, wow, how could you be so ignorant? Should the Lord tarry for 150 years, there's going to be a people 150 years looking back at us going, how could you not see this? 
All the great marvelous things that he was doing, laying the pathwork, laying the foundation for his return, and you guys just went on your daily lives as though it meant nothing. Okay? It's much easier to see the 2020 vision in hindsight than it is in foresight. So before you jump all over the Jews, remember you're kind of in the same boat. Okay? We get busy with life. We have things that we've got to do. We've got taxes that need to be paid. We've got dogs that need to be fed. We have life that happens. And the problem is we get so busy with life that we take our eyes off of the light. And before too long, we find ourselves stumbling in the dark. Okay? The only way we keep our way lit is by keeping our eyes on him. Okay? And the psalmist says it. Your word is a light to my path. Okay? This, this is the light. The spirit lives inside of us. This is the primary way the light is shown. This is how we receive it and understand it. But it's also this that should be played out through us, isn't it? Isn't it? Uh, what is the first gospel people are going to read from you? Are they going to come over to your house and pick up your Bible and start reading it? Because if that's the first gospel that they ever read from you, you're doing something wrong. Okay? Um, is it, you know, you just sit them down one day and start quoting scripture and you share with them the gospel? Shouldn't the gospel be revealed to them first in how we live? The manner in which we present ourselves? The things that we talk about and the manner in which we talk about them? See, that's one of the problems that we have is, you know, who lights a light and then puts a bushel over it? We do. All the time. We light a light, we have the light of life living inside of us that should be pouring out through us. Think lighthouse, not flickering candle, okay? And that light should be pouring out so that all that are around us that are in darkness should be able to recognize the difference, shouldn't they? I mean, I, I can tell the difference between a dark room and a light room. I don't have any dark rooms in my house because evidently I'm the only one that's figured out that light switches work both ways. <laughs> Light, 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 light. And I walk through the house, and every house in the back of the room, and there's nobody in the rooms. Hey, look, it goes down, too. And down, and down. And I used to think, what is the big deal when my dad would gripe at us for that? <laughs> Evidently, there's something in the gene pool when you become a father. Things just go click, and they bother you. Because when I was a kid, I never noticed. My dad would be, what, what is wrong with this house? <laughs> Well, right now you're mad, but I don't know why. <laughs> no, 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 look around you. Uh, I'm going to get beat for something I have no clue. <laughs> you kind of start edging over behind a sibling. <laughs> the lights, all the lights are on. Okay. And then what's the problem? You turn it off, turn it off. Uh, and I know I, I harass my family. Poor Christy. She goes in, turns on the light, realizes she forgot something, goes out to go get it, and I turn the light off. She's got to turn the light on twice. So, but isn't that kind of like how we are? We get into a situation, and we're not really sure, so we kind of have that bushel, and, you know, you're kind of with that person that you think might be a Christian, but you're not sure, so you kind of come up close to them, and you kind of peek a little light at them, and you see if they're going to peek a little light back, or you got to peek a, peek a little more. Well, let me see your light. Oh, she's not a Christian. I'm going to go over here. <laughs> okay. But isn't that what we do? Shouldn't the bushel just be thrown away and let the light shine regardless? The whole purpose of the light is to dispel the darkness. Not to run away from it. Okay? Not, not to be afraid of it. I mean, where there is light, there is no darkness. Okay? So we go in, we let the light shine... And, and really, who's responsible for that, us or him? Yeah. He is. Okay? All we got to do is let the light shine. So let's go back. I'm going to recap real quick. Lots of numbers BC. Lots of numbers BC. Bad things happen at the temple. Yay! Dedicate the temple. Uh-oh, not enough oil. Miraculously, the oil lasts. Hanukkah. Try it. Jesus celebrates Hanukkah. 
and probably played with the dreidel. <laughs> and yet, we have a light that is so much better than the light that they're celebrating that we can celebrate this Christmas. And, and not just celebrate like with decorating the tree or, or opening a present. We have a light that we, we have the most precious gift in the world that we can share with people. And uh, uh, well, all the people that I hang out with are Christians. Expand. Expand your group. Um, you know, for the first few years Christian and I were married, we went to a Christian college. We worked at Christian companies. And we fellowshiped at a Christian church. So we didn't, here we are, I'm learning how to be a pastor, I'm learning how to minister, and I'm never in the world. We, we pull ourselves out and we make this close little group. And it's distressing, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Look, when Jesus left and the church settled in Jerusalem, what happened? They weren't doing what God said. He said that you were to take the light out into the world, okay? And they settled and God said, all right, I gave you fair warning, boom! And he kicked them out of Jerusalem and they scattered. And he did that through persecution, okay? And then they went to Judea and Samaria and all over the world, all right? And, and I, I, on the one hand, I'm a, I'm a little nervous, I'm a little afraid. And on the other hand, I'm kind of almost praying for this. I think it's time we get persecuted and we get booted out of our comfortable little niche, our comfortable little building, our comfortable little <coughs> fellowship, and we're required to go out and shine that light in dark places. Okay? Um, I think we're seeing this all over the world. Um, we have revivals going on in Iran, Iraq, Syria all over the Middle East that you guys are not hearing about because it's more newsworthy to show people getting slaughtered. We have these Muslims that are committing these atrocities all of a sudden realizing that their faith is empty. Look, I've done everything I can for Allah and I don't feel any better. There's nothing more for me. What's, what's left? And all of a sudden they're looking at these people that they're slaughtering and going, why, why are they so happy? What do they have to be cheerful about? Okay? And we're seeing revival. We're seeing revival in Israel. That's one of the things that they, they just kept pushing over and over and over again when we were in Israel this last time. How great a revival is taking place there. And how many of the Hasidim are, are coming back to Israel, but, but the Gentiles are coming as well, and they're, they're bringing the light with them. And all of a sudden, the, the Jews, who on the one hand are so lost in their religion, and on the other hand, have no religion, they've just given up on everything, all of a sudden a great light is shining. And they're going, ah, oh, or oi. <laughs> and we're seeing revival, okay? So I want to challenge you today. The light has come into the world. This light dwells within you. This light is to dispel the darkness. So you've got to go where the darkness is for it to work. Okay. Amen? Amen. All right. Father, we thank you. God, that when everything looked at its worst, that it looked as if there was no hope, you sent your son. The timing was perfect. The time was right. And a light came into the darkness. The darkness didn't understand it. But Father, you have taken us from the dark and brought us into the fellowship fellowship in light. I'm asking God that you would drive us to take this light into dark places. That Father, we would lay aside the bushels. That we would be proud to proclaim that we belong to you. That we would scorn anything that would set itself against that light. That Father, we would be a people that is faithful in the commission you've given us, a people that pleases you greatly, that would be a delight to you. I ask God that you would give us wisdom, give us courage. Help us, Father, to build step by step 
this fellowship, this family, this church that you desire. And I'm not talking about this building, Father, but this body universally that you desire. We bless you today, Father, and we thank you that you are merciful, that you are gracious, that you are loving. We pray these things in the precious name of your son, Jesus. Amen.